Hi, this is Kelsey Fikowski, and in this video we're going to do an overview of period one and two concepts. So big ideas from period one, certainly uh, maize or corn, is going to be very important towards the Native Americans as it allows them to now have a more permanent lifestyle and sort of instead of being a nomad and really wondering each morning and spending most of your day hunting and gathering food, now they can specialize in doing other things. Certainly another big idea is going to be the role that disease is going to have within uh, the North American and South American continent for Native Americans as they are not immune to the diseases from Europe. Smallpox in particular is going to be a number one killer. Now it is important to note that when we look at Native American tribes, they are unique. Just simply calling them natives as just a group really doesn't do it justice to the individuality of each tribe, which we'll get to on the next slide. So hold off on that for just a second. But undoubtedly, uh, one thing that's going to certainly impact Native Americans is going to be the Columbian Exchange, where you're going to have the transfer of new goods, new foods, animals such as the horse, and of course disease being transferred to the North American continent. But you also have goods and foods also going back as well. And eventually, for example, tobacco, which will certainly change uh, much of Europe as, as in terms of getting them addicted and introducing a new commodity. But as I said before, right, Native Americans are very different. If you're in the Pacific Northwest, you're mainly hunter-gatherers, you have longhouses, and they are adapting to their environment. They're very good at that. In the Great Plains, Basin Indians, right, they are, the buffalo is going to be hunted uh, quite a lot. Once horses are introduced, that's going to be an asset in building a stronger military. Whereas on the Atlantic seaboard, you see more permanent villages, you see hunting, and then of course you have the infamous Iroquois Confederacy in the Northeast, which is unique because it's matriarchal based in which you have females running many of the local affairs because they're the ones not out hunting. So that's going to be very important there. So again, keep in mind, these are just only a small snippet of the thousands of Native American tribes that exist. Other pertinent uh, period one information to keep in mind is that when you have Spanish contact, particularly in present day Central and South America, you're going to have this new caste system and a new racially diverse population. So you're going to have the Spaniards uh, mixing with the Native American population as well as the African population. So you're going to have a new class of people such as the Mestizos, which is Native American and Spanish blood, as well as Mulattoes, who are going to be a mixture of the Spanish blood and African blood. Also keep in mind that a big theme is, you know, throughout the 16th, 17th, and eventually 1800s, and even today, you have Native Americans trying to preserve their own autonomy, governing, governing their own affairs. Um, however, the encroachment that's going to increase quite significantly, uh, particularly from the English, is going to make this very, very difficult. Also keep in mind that in the Atlantic world, we have the three worlds colliding with Africa, Europe, and the Americas. And this begins with the age of exploration, with our three Gs of gold, God, and glory. Now, the Portuguese and the Spanish are way ahead of the English. The English come very late to the game, uh, almost 100 years late. And the first attempt to establish a colony in the New World is going to be the Roanoke Colony. Of course, this is going to fail miserably, but this is, again, their first major attempt to get in on the action, and it is a complete failure. And, of course, once we get to the Jamestown Colony, that almost becomes a failure, um, but it is able to survive. So, again, countries are trying to colonize for those three G's. So, big ideas from period two. Very important to note the differences and struggles that Europeans are going to have with Native Americans. They're going to have a different relationship. Also keep in mind, what are the seeds of self-government in shaping this new nation? Already the seeds are being sprouted. Keep in mind as well, this revolution is brewing, in a way, very early on, in the minds of the colonists, and it's eventually going to lead, as we'll see in period three, uh, the fight for independence. But let's stick with the colonies in the New World, some of the major ones, amongst others. You have Jamestown, of course, uh, with John Smith, and you have those lab laborers who are from predominantly wealthy backgrounds who are not accustomed to hard labor, and everybody's looking for gold. Well, Jamestown doesn't have much gold. And as a result, the colony almost fails without the assistance of the Native Americans. But keep in mind that what eventually keeps Jamestown afloat is going to be the use of brown gold, that of course being tobacco. And keep in mind, you don't really have families coming to Jamestown right away. It's predominantly uh, men. 
Uh, whereas Plymouth, you tend to see more families coming about, and that is going to establish the Mayflower Compact. Some even call it the first constitution uh, in the colonies. It really depends on how you look at it. But nevertheless, this is where you're going to find your Puritans, Pilgrims, Separatists, those um, all, of course, are the same people. But this is a very, very strict colony, certainly governed by religion. So while you do see town hall meetings, you do have some seeds of democracy there. By no means are we in a full-fledged democracy. You also see Connecticut uh, being founded by Thomas Hooker. And some even look at uh, Connecticut as having the first constitution written in American history called the Fundamental Orders of Connecticut that actually is going to establish a representative government with a legislature that is elected by a popular vote as well as a governor chosen by the legislature. So uh, Connecticut early on also has those seeds of democracy. Rhode Island, of course, coming about as a result of Roger Williams, who's going to be banished for, uh, from Plymouth, uh, and eventually you'll find Anne Hutchinson there. And, of course, they are the, your very famous religious dissenters. Now, Maryland is going to be founded as a safe haven, in particular for Catholics, uh, by Lord Calvert, or a.k.a. Lord Baltimore. And that's, of course, going to be a safe haven, or really promote toleration for any Christian, um, not any religion, just Christianity. And then in North Carolina and South Carolina, while they do share a similar name, they are very different. You'll note that the South Carolina uh, state is really much more uh, influenced by the Barbados culture as you'll have the slave owners from the Barbados come to South Carolina introducing sort of that slave-owning mindset. And South Carolina is going to be a major hub for slavery. Right around the Civil War, you're going to have more slaves than white people. Whereas North Carolina doesn't have as much of a need for slavery as, let's say, South Carolina, but North Carolina is going to be influenced a little bit more by Virginia, which is going to have the House of Burgesses, and they're going to have something very similar. Keep in mind, a Burgess is simply an inhabitant, and they're going to be given some representation. So even when you look at Mar uh, Virginia, rather, you have the Ordinances of Virginia, and that, of course, is giving the people a voice in their government. And then you have the unique colony of Georgia, founded by James Oglethorpe, which is supposed to be this place for debtors, and it's also supposed to, you know, give another second chance for people. But also the practical purpose of Georgia was to be a buffer from Florida, which at this time is occupied by the Spanish. Now, Native Americans are the biggest obstacle for the English, and we see a number of problems with the English. They have terrible relations. They really don't have any intermarriage. They have no contact, really. And when they do have contact, it's usually some war. Um, and we see this coming to a head in the New England colonies with King Philip's War, where the Indians are trying to unite and, and try to beat the British, but of course they're going to fail, and they're never really going to pose a serious threat to England ever again. Um, despite, of course, you know, think about Jamestown, natives are going to assist in the Jamestown colony, but again, that's going to all be very, very much short-lived. But on the other hand, you look at the Dutch and, and the French, you certainly have friendlier relations there. Even in Pennsylvania, even though that is founded by an English settler, William Penn, um, they're going to have friendlier relationships. Spanish, we, as we talked about earlier, are going to have mixed relations, they're going to intermarry, as did the Dutch and French. Remember, this is much more characterized based on trade more than anything, but the English having the worst relations overall. So going back to our seats of, of uh, self-government, you see this in Mayflower Compact. You see these separatists from England coming to the Plymouth Colony. They're devising a compact or a contract, establishing a framework for our Constitution. This is happening really early on in the 1600s, quite impressive. As I explained earlier with the Ordinances of Virginia, uh, the Virginia Company could not pass laws without the approval of the House of Burgesses. Again, remember, Burgesses are inhabitants, so the people have a say. Even the Great Awakening, this is the first American or uniquely colonial event where it binds all people for the first time under this religious spiritual awakening led by, of course, uh, George Whitefield and John Edwards. And, of course, salutary neglect, which is going to happen, where England is sort of going to be relaxed on laws such as the Navigation Acts until we get to the French and Indian War. And this is where you're giving the colonists a chance to rule themselves in exchange for economic loyalty back in England. And they get a taste of self-government, and they like it. It's like an ice cream cone. You take one lick of chocolate, you want more licks. And similar to the colonists here, they want more self-government. So when England is going to try to take back that self-government, after the French and Indian War, that is not going to work out all that well. 
Some other important events to mention in our last slide here about period two, you have Bacon's Rebellion. And of course, that is where you're going to have the poor colonists, both black and white, uniting not only to defeat Native Americans, but also going after the rich landowners who are not protecting them, they're not representing them. And the rich landowners are going to try to divide the white and black um, uh, farmers, if you will, um, and this is going to establish what eventually it's called the one drop rule. And it's going to sort of make white poor people feel better than black people. It's going to establish a racial hierarchy that if you have one drop of blood in you that's African, you are considered lesser. And that was done purposely to prevent whites and blacks, particularly the poor uh, farmers, from uniting ever again. Also keep in mind, with respect to period two, this is all driven by mercantilism, right? That's the age of exploration, where you're going to try to enrich the mother country by accumulating as much wealth and natural resources as possible. And when, of course, the British are going to try to enforce the Navigation Acts in the 13 colonies, right, that is, of course, mercantilism at its best. Of course, those are not going to be very popular. Another important event, right, the use of labor in Jamestown. We first start with Native Americans. That doesn't work all that well since they are very much um, acclimated to the land. They can escape easily. So then we try indentured servants where you pay you, uh, their own way here. And in return for their way being paid uh, to Jamestown, they have to give four to seven years of their, of their life to serving you. But even they would escape. They weren't all that reliable. And that's eventually where we're going to wind up with African slaves. And of course, tobacco, brown gold, is going to be the saving grace of the colonies. And then finally, of course, we have our religious dissenters where they're saying that the people don't need to rely on the church or the ministers for interpreting things like the Bible. And of course, that's going to make Rhode Island to be more of a safe haven for religious tolerance. And you're going to see some dissenters going there as well. So that's a brief cursory overview. Again, really focus on the big ideas uh, with respect to the struggles with natives, seeds of self-government. Again, how is this revolution going to be brewing in the mines? Um, of course, we're not at that point where we're going to be fighting the revolution. That will be period three. But then going back to period one as well, tribes are unique. They adapt to their environment well. Columbian exchange without a doubt. And, of course, the role of uh, maize and disease.